<laughs> Good evening, think ladies and gentlemen. Larry doesn't think he liked them. You know? For those I have not yet had the pleasure to meet, I am Amy Myers, director of the Yale Center for British Art, and I am delighted to welcome you to the opening of Salt and Silver, Early Photography, 1840 to 1860 organized by the Wilson Center for Photography in London in concert with the Yale Center for British Art. In 1977, the year the Yale Center opened to the public, I matriculated as a doctoral student in American Studies in order to write a dissertation on the photographers who went west after the Civil War on the four <coughs> major imperial scientific surveys organized by the federal government to help to secure the nation's hold on the continent. Although I attended one of the first graduate seminars held in this building, a course on John Ruskin taught by George, George Hersey, and I came to study aspects of the institution's spectacular collections, particularly as they relate to the history of science, I never thought to explore the small but important early photographic holdings that the center's founder, Paul Mellon, was in the process of donating to the institution as part of his incomparable collection of British illustrated books. Perhaps understandably, given the immeasurably rich opportunities offered to graduate students at Yale, I immersed myself in the truly stupendous collection of American photographs at the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library, organized my first solo exhibition, American Photographs, 1840 to 1940 at the Yale University Art Gallery, and had the great privilege of assisting Alan Trachtenberg in writing classic essays on photography. But I never viewed a photograph in what quietly would become an increasingly important collection here at the center. Now, as I enter my final year as the center's director, hmm. I know our collection of photographs very well. And I can say that it has grown magnificently over the decades, largely due to the interests of our curators, including Elizabeth Fairman, Scott Wilcox, and for many years, Jillian Forrester, as well as our generous patrons, who have understood that our tremendous holdings of paintings, drawings, prints, watercolors, rare books, manuscripts, and sculpture, would remain incomplete without significant examples of works in the various media, media that collectively have come to be known as photography. Indeed, in the last several years, we have made a concerted effort to join the Beinecke and the Art Gallery in developing Yale's photographic holdings in a strategic and concerted way. And we have increased our collection manyfold with gifts and purchases of major bodies of work from the birth of photography in 1839 through the contemporary moment. Important donations have come from Henry Hacker, James and Claire Hyman, Graham Howe, Michael Childers, Dr. and Mrs. J. Patrick Kennedy, Bruce and D. Lundeberg, Charles Isaacs and Carol Negro, Hans P. Krauss, and others too numerous to name, but to whom we are deeply indebted. Chichara Mollingham has joined us as our first assistant curator of photography, and she has worked closely with Elizabeth Scott, Matthew Hargraves, and Martina Droth to form what is quickly becoming a truly great collection of British photographs for teaching and research at Yale. While augmenting our photography collection, we also have been undertaking significant research focused on the materiality of photographic prints, from those of Fox Talbot, to those of Bill Brandt in association with Paul Messier and his colleagues at Yale's new Institute for the Preservation of Cultural Heritage on Yale's West Campus, and with Sarah Turner at our sister institution, the Paul Mellon Center for Studies in British Art in London. Additionally, we have a rich series of exhibitions and their accompanying publications on British photography in development extending what always has been an important pro program of photographic exhibitions and publications here at the center into this exciting new era of collection development and research. The first of these exhibitions now has come to fruition in the form of Salt and Silver, and we are thrilled to be able to offer this important exploration of the initial photographic paper print process invented in England by Fox Talbot in 1839, well, 
perhaps he was experimenting mm -hmm. before 1839, but certainly the public um, uh, rolling out of these extraordinary photographs begins at that point. And promoted not only by British practitioners, by, but by early photographers working around the globe. With the exception of a few examples from our own extensive holdings, the rare and exquisitely beautiful salted paper prints in this exhibition have been selected from the remarkable collection of the Wilson Center for Photography. Our project originated in a somewhat smaller version of the exhibition, organized jointly by the Wilson Center and Tate Britain, that was shown in tandem with the exhibition Victorian Sculpture, which we ourselves organized with Tate in 2015. At that time, we began negotiations with the Wilson Center to bring salt and silver here to Yale for the pleasure of our own audiences, and we are delighted that this now has come to pass. Indeed, we are indebted to Michael and Jane Wilson for their generosity in lending the more than 100 prints included in our iteration of this exhibition, and to Hope Kingsley, Curator of Education and Collections at the Wilson Center, who has served as the lead curator on the project with her colleague, Polly Fleury, who heads special projects with the Wilson Collection. The organizing curator at the Yale Center for British Art has been Chitra Romalingham, under the direction of Scott Wilcox, who now serves as our Deputy Director of Collections. We are grateful to our Registrar's Department and our Design and Installations team for ensuring the safe arrival of the Wilson Center's precious prints and for working with Chitra and Hope to create the brilliant installation that you will find in our third floor galleries. Special thanks are due to Sarah Welcome, Assistant Curator of Rare Books and Manuscripts, for assisting with the mounting of the albums included in this show. To accompany the exhibition, we have reprinted the excellent catalog produced when Salt and Silver was shown at Tate Britain, which was edited by Marta Braun and Hope Kingsley, with an introduction by Simon Baker and contributions by other distinguished colleagues in the field. After the exhibition closes here at the center on September 9th, it will travel to the Ruth Chandler Williamson Gallery at Scripps College in Claremont, California, where it will be on view from November 10th to November 16th of this year. We are deeply grateful to the Williamson's director, Mary McNaughton, one of my very dearest and oldest friends in California, and her colleagues for working with us to extend the exhibition to their audiences. To begin this evening's program, I'm delighted to introduce Scott Wilcox, who will moderate a panel discussion with Mark Osterman, process historian at the George Eastman Museum in Rochester, New York, Hope Kingsley, and Chitra Romalingham. Following their discussion, please enjoy viewing the exhibition in our third floor galleries and join us in the library court on the second floor to raise a glass to all who have worked so hard to make this fine collaboration come to pass. Thank you. <clears throat> it's my great pleasure to introduce our three speakers this evening, Hope, Chitra, and Mark. They will each make a brief presentation in quick succession, um, and will then move on to a discussion of issues uh, arising from their presentations and, and from the exhibition upstairs. Now, in the interest of time and a nice tight program, we will not be taking questions from the audience, but I encourage you all to pursue your questions with the speakers in the exhibition um, and in the reception that Amy just uh, mentioned, uh, following the conversation here in the auditorium. All right, so Hope Kingsley has since 2008 been the curator for education and collections at the Wilson Center for Photography, um, a nonprofit archive for the preservation, study, and research of the history and aesthetics of photography. Um, the Wilson Center is the largest private photographic collection in Britain. Its holdings span the history of photography from the earliest extant works, uh, many of which are on display upstairs, uh, to the most contemporary productions. Now, for more than 20 years, 
Hope has taught the material and aesthetic history of photography at colleges and universities in Britain. Uh, among her many exhibitions and publications, I'll mention just two outstanding exhibitions. Um, she was the lead curator for Seduced by Art, Photography Past and Present at the National Gallery in London in 2012, which then went on to uh, showings in Barcelona and Madrid the following year. And in 2016, she co-curated Painting with Light, Art and Photography from the Pre-Raphaelites to the Modern Age at Tate Britain. As Amy mentioned, Hope was one of the curators and catalog editors for uh, Salt and Silver in its original presentation at Tate Britain in 2015. Uh, and she has worked with our own uh, Chitra in adapting and expanding Salt and Silver for presentation here at the center. Chitra Ramalingam is Assistant Curator of Photography at the Yale Center for British Art. She is, in fact, the first curator of photography here at the center. Uh, after a PhD in, his, in the history of science from Harvard University, she held fellowships at the Science Museum in London and the University of Cambridge before coming to Yale. Her research and teaching focus on the early history of photography in Britain and the visual and material culture of Victorian science. She is the author of the forthcoming book, To See a Spark, Experiment and Visual Experience in Victorian Science from Yale University Press. And she is the co-editor of William Henry Fox Talbot Beyond Photography one of the studies in British art volumes from Yale University Press, uh, which came out in 2013. Finally, Mark Osterman is a photographic process historian at the George Eastman Museum in Rochester, New York. He is internationally recognized for his research, writings, lectures, and demonstrations of the technical ev evolution of pre-1900 photography. Uh, best known in photographic conservation circles, Mark taught process identification and mechanisms of deterioration in the advanced residency program in photographic conservation at George Eastman Museum from 1999 to 2009. He remains a valuable resource for the conservation community. Since 2010, he has taught private tutorials, guided research, and group workshops in historic photographic processes for the George Eastman Museum and at many international venues. Uh, Mark's fine art photographs are an important influence for a growing movement of artists using historic photographic processes. Uh, he is represented by Howard Greenberg Gallery in New York, uh, Photo Gallery International in Tokyo and Tilt Gallery in Scottsdale, Arizona. So, Hope. Thank you. Good evening. It's lovely to be here. Um, this is a project that has been a real pleasure to work on. I wanted extend all thanks to the Yale Center for British Art, to Amy and Scott for being inspired by this exhibition and bringing it to the center, and above all to Chitra. Working with you has been a tremendous pleasure and a privilege. Gratitude and appreciation must also go to my Wilson Center colleagues, Polly Fleury and Ellen Neff, who waded through vast swathes of administrative and curatorial work to produce the exhibition and to Jane and Michael Wilson, whose support for the project has been enthusiastic and steadfast. Well, Wilson Center over many years has collected photographs whose pictorial and material qualities show historical photography in its best light, and importantly, give us access to how the works looked in their own time, taking us back to the past and back to how those who made the photographs actually saw the fruits of their efforts. The works include salter, salted paper prints, which are the focus of this exhibition. And these very rare 
early photographs are the beginning of photography on paper made within the first two decades of photography's history. The works are not as well known today as perhaps they might be partly because of their rarity, both in the number of prints and the number of practicing photographers. But the output of these photographers belies their numbers, and the exhibition follows the spread of photography around the world, from Britain and Europe to North Africa, the Middle East, and onwards to India, China, Mexico, and the United States. The exhibition begins in England with uh, the work of William Henry Fox Talbot, whose scientific investigations led to his invention of paper photography during the 1830s, the results of which he announced in 1839. Here, photography right away was this marvelous new territory of image making, and in the exhibition, we're showing Talbot's work in its tremendous experimental richness as he tries out different applications, different subject matters, and exploring the possibilities of the medium. Talbot's circle included artists as well as photographers, notably the Scottish duo of the painter David Octavius Hill and the young photographer Robert Adamson. Such collaborations as theirs produced works whose sophistication show us how quickly the practitioners of this new medium found their feet, both technically and artistically. The exhibition moves on to the 1850s, and this is a time when photography is picking up momentum, when the London-based photographer, Roger Fenton, is um, pursuing challenging projects, including documenting the Crimean War. Fenton's wider ambition, the professionalization of photography, led to his central role in founding the Photographic Society of London. In this, he was encouraged by his French photographic peers, who he'd met as uh, they were all painting students in Paris in the 1840s. And in Paris, a new photographic society was being formed. So it was, uh, there was tremendous back and forth across the channel. And French photographers are an important part of this exhibition. These are early years when photographers are connected by geographical proximity um, and when letters and personal connections are the main means of dissemination. But we've also been able to show the way in which photographic education began, notably uh, the photographic school or atelier that was set up on the outskirts of Paris by Gustave Le Gray. And this, ex this uh, photograph shows one of Le Gray's students photographing another of Le Gray's students in the courtyard of the atelier. French photographers moved into established structures for publishing prints to attract audiences with views of, for example, modern cityscapes and historical monuments in Europe and beyond. Photographers photographed antiquities in North Africa, the Middle East, and India. In Rhodes, the artist, archaeologist, and photographer, August Salzman, documented an excavation that he participated in. And these are really quite extraordinary images. They um, are simple and they are striking, and yet they're actually made as records of the objects that were being excavated. And the prints themselves are publisher's proofs. This exhibition, thus, is not simply about aesthetics, but it investigates the purposes and the products of photography at this time, even in its earliest years. When the exhibition moves on to the Americas, there's a wonderful group of works from Mexico, for portraits by Ignacio Rocha, who shows the urban and professional denizens of a newly independent Mexico, including this academic painter who had just triumphed at the National Academy exhibition, and his success shows in his confident posture and his elegant clothes. 
The exhibition ends in the United States with a fascinating album of Yale's graduating class of 1856. The album's compiler, Ahab George Wilkinson, annotated the portrait pages with his classmates' backgrounds and histories and their, and their histories as they evolved, some of which were admirable and some of perhaps rather less than us. <laughs> there are some great stories. Nearby the album are portraits of workers that appeared in other class albums at other colleges, and they show us people who could never have afforded a photographic portrait of themselves. They give us a sense of where photography would go forward from here, knitting together a vast and diverse and ultimately democratic visual world of people and places. everyone. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, and thank you to all the participants tonight, especially my fellow traveler and collaborator in this project, Hope, from whom I've learned a lot um, over the course of our working together. So by, bring, by bringing together salt prints from these first two decades of photography's public existence, Salt and Silver offers a glimpse into a moment when photography's identity, so what it is and what it's for, were very much up for grabs. There are many threads, therefore, these sort of different photographic histories that one can follow through the exhibition. And right now, um, for this presentation, I'm going to suggest one of the less obvious of these kind of routes that one could follow. So I'm going to suggest that we think about exploring what we could call the knowledge economy of mid-19th century Europe, how we know things through pictures, how Europeans knew things, knew things through pictures, how visual information traveled or didn't travel in some cases, and how that is shaped by the specific materialities and physical presence of the photograph itself. So this print on the screen is at the very entrance to the exhibition. Its most obvious and striking feature to us now is the brush marks around the border, which somehow evoke both the messiness and the magic of their making. We're not really meant to have seen them. Talbot would have originally um, trimmed the edges of the, the print off of it, before sharing it with friends or mounting it for sale. But those brush marks call our attention to the fact that every paper photograph in these years was a unique handmade object. Even though dozens of prints might be made from the same negative, and even when people began to produce them on a commercial scale. But let's not allow the, the almost painterly magic of those brush marks to blind us to what this print was for, the mundane purpose that it represented. When Talbot included this print in copies of his serial photographic publication, The Pencil of Nature, he titled it A Facsimile of an Old Printed Page. The purpose was to demonstrate one possible future for photography, copying and disseminating texts. This concern with the mundane work of copying might seem less obvious in this beautiful study of a Hellenic sculpture that Talbot called Patroclus, a figure from Homer's Iliad. This bust was Talbot's most photographed subject. He returned to it again and again, dozens of times, as he experimented with the play of light and shade on the plaster surface with different angles of view and framing. Um, this version of Patroclus is not in the exhibition, although it is in the Wilson Center collection, and it's on the cover of the catalog. It's too, um, too light sensitive for display. Um, it's very beautiful. These works are highly staged and artful but they are also quite self-consciously entries into the world of art reproduction. Each of them is in fact a copy of a copy. I'm talking about these views of Patroclus here. So this bust that he photographed was a plaster cast. Talbot had obtained um, a copy of an original bust that's in the British Museum in London. The museum had an associated group of approved cast makers to sell copies of rare objects in their collection for use by drawing schools and for the collections of connoisseurs and classical scholars like Talbot himself. The British Museum itself was slow to take on photography as part of a systematic program to render objects in their collection more mobile and more profitable. A decade after Talbot's obsessive study of Patroclus, the British Museum finally hired their first photographer, Roger Fenton, to start documenting the collections and again offering, offering photographs for sale to a similar clientele as the plaster casts. 
But returning to Talbot's own archive, one continually comes across records of this more workaday function for photographs as just copies. So here's an example that's quite different from anything on view in our exhibition here. And I include it to kind of give you a sense of the different directions that move out of this exhibition beyond the walls of this museum. So for Talbot, this print was clearly a working object, both of these prints. They're not luxurious works of art to be treasured necessarily, but they're rather a, a part of day-to-day -day scholarship and study. Talbot was, in addition to being a photographic pioneer, he was also one of the scholars of classical and Near, Near Eastern antiquity who was working to decipher cuneiform, the script of the ancient Mesopotamians. He purchased these Fenton photographs from the British Museum so that he would have copies at home of these rare clay tablets, only recently excavated at Nineveh in what is now northern Iraq. As he deciphered and translated the text, he scribbled his translations and transliterations in pencil onto the surface of the prints. And there are dozens like it in Talbot's archive. And they're all part of the material culture of Assyriology, as much as the original tablets themselves were. So as you move through the exhibition, you could consider how individuals, um, photographers themselves, but also compilers of photographs into albums and publications and portfolios, how they were using this new medium to record and document and inventory objects and render them more mobile. You could also consider how early women photographers documented emotional bonds and private histories in albums and scrapbooks that were produced for a secluded family life to be perused only in intimate settings. You could consider how mid-19th century readers of the newly proliferating illustrated periodicals hungered for visual information about current events. Natural disasters like the catastrophic flooding of the Rhone Valley in 1856, or about the progress of military campaigns like the Crimean War. Not only about victories and defeats on the battlefields, but also the intriguing cast of multi-ethnic, multinational characters um, in the camps of the Allied forces. And you could also think about how many more people encountered Fenton's photographs, not in the originals, but via engravings and woodcuts that were made after them. And what a different view on the conflict they felt themselves to be receiving when they saw a printed illustration captioned with the increasingly frequent phrase, from a photograph, which I now realize is cut off at the bottom of the picture, sorry. <laughs> You could also consider, as you move through the rooms upstairs, how new networks of transportation, but also new routes of European imperial ambition, encouraged French and British photographers and archaeologists to journey up the Nile, or into the Near East in quest of images of the landscapes of biblical, image, uh, of biblical history. Or how and why colonial bureaucracies like the British East India Company might seek to compile visual information about the glories of India's architectural heritage by commissioning photographs of South India's most monumental Hindu temples from a military photographer um, in their ranks. Linnaeus Tripe's long exposures make the India of his photo photographs seem timeless outside of history. It's a deliberate move, especially for a colonial administration seeking to consolidate its power after a violent and destabilizing rebellion of 1857. This is made just one year later, or less than a year later than the start. But a closer look at the bottom right-hand corner of this image reveals that light has leaked in from the edge of the camera um, and created these strange artifacts on the corner of the negative. It's a mistake, an artifact of the photograph's making that contributes to the theatrical effect of the composition. But it is also a reminder, as this entire exhibition should be, that no place and no photograph stands outside of history. Thank you. Chitra asked me to make sense of the salted paper process in five to seven minutes. <laughs> I can't do that. I'll do the best I can. But I can tell you that the salted paper print went by many names. And there were things that led to the salted paper print and things that came after the period that we're looking at in the collection, a fantastic collection in the exhibition. It's, um, make sure I have my picture here. It's, uh, it's very difficult to place a proper name, but I can tell you that the salted paper print is of a family called silver chloride prints. And the silver chloride print 
depending on when it was made and how it was made and how it was finished, has its own name. And it makes it very difficult to place, even within the captions in the exhibition itself. I can tell you that the basics are that you start out with silver nitrate, which is actually a salt, and it's mixed with sodium chloride, which is another salt. Silver nitrate is a salt in the sense that any crystal in the 19th century that you could dissolve in water was called a salt. We still use the term salt for table salt, maybe Epsom salt, bath salt. But in the 19th century, if you were making an image that involved the use of sodium chloride, which is now table salt, and silver nitrate, you were making something that relied on the light sensitivity of silver chloride. And let me show you what that looks like. If I take salt water dissolved in this flask and silver nitrate dissolved in this and combine the two, I instantly have a byproduct of silver chloride. It's heavy, and within seconds, all of that ended up on the bottom of the bottle of the flask. You could take that and you could smear that paste on paper and you could expose it to light, and light would turn that back to metallic silver. And that's the basis of all silver-based photography. You have silver chemical, you have light. Somehow you have to make the silver chemical turn back into metallic silver. But here's how it looks when you're making this image on paper. So instead of spreading a paste on the paper, you would spread with this brush, this Blanchard brush, made with a piece of glass and, and cotton, you would brush the solution of salt water onto the paper. You would then allow that paper to dry, and when dry, you would then brush it again with the solution of silver nitrate. And by doing this in two steps, you don't have the paste, you have that substance formed in the fibers of the paper. Much easier to deal with. And so you let that dry. Now, there were other ways of coating the papers. You could float the paper on the solutions. You could spread them with glass rods. There were many ways. Of, you could submerge the paper in salt water. But you couldn't do that with the silver nitrate. And once you had the paper sensitive to light, and by the way, it's so sparingly sensitive to light that we could coat this paper and sensitize it with all of the lights on in this room. You don't need a safe light. You don't need a dark room. In the time it took me to pick up my camera to take this picture, it has already started to darken. It's what they would call scotophorous salts, salts which turn dark when exposed to light. And so they get progressively darker, and eventually you would take the fern off the paper. You have a negative photograph. You'd call it a photogram, not with a camera, but nature printing itself. The problem is that if you let that continue to be exposed to light, it eventually turns dark everywhere else. So the thing is, the invention of photography is not really making an image, it's keeping an image. That's the hard part. You can go to the local food store right now and find probably a hundred things that you can smear on paper and have them either darken or lighten with the effect of light. But you must keep the image. One of the earliest forms of a salt paper or silver chloride print is uh, something called the photogenic drawing, and you heard that mentioned already. And you also heard it mentioned that there aren't any in the show, the reason being is that they're still sensitive to light. Uh, this is uh, a little experiment I did from an engraving, and on the left hand side is the control. This panel is uh, exposed to bromide, this panel is exposed to iodide, and this panel is exposed to chloride, and this one is exposed to something called sodium thiosulfate. We now call it hypo. This is the only one that wins. And yet, look how colorful photography was prior to that. Herschel knew about this before the invention of photography. And so the problem with these is you all haven't really removed any of the light-sensitive chemistry. You've made it just less sensitive. And they're beautiful. And there's a reason why Talbot made them long after he knew about this.
but you'll never see one on display for good reason. They were made in a camera like this. You could look in the hole. I have a cutaway in my drawing. You could look in a hole and you could see the image and then put a cork in the hole. And you could do that with the light coming in on the paper. Uh, this is one I made at Laycock Abbey. It took two hours to expose. And once it was treated with iodide, which is the reason why it's yellow, it could be used as a negative in contact with another piece of paper and then treated with uh, bromide to give this beautiful blue and brown image. Again, photography was very colorful, and then it went brown for a long time. This is a, um, a picture of a calotype negative, which was Talbot's second invention as far as negatives are concerned. It's interesting, the silver chloride process was used originally in a camera, and then it was set aside to be used for printing when this was invented. This is the calotype and this one is a waxed calotype negative I made in 1995. This is what it looks like by reflected light before it was on a light table. And it's being put into a printing frame. That sensitive paper is now placed on top. And this is with the lights on. I made these pictures last week. No, so, no safe light, no dark room put it in the sun, and the sun is now going through that paper negative and exposing the sensitive paper underneath. And the advantage of having that printing frame, which has a back with a hinge, you can see that on the left-hand side, is that you can check the printing without changing the registration. If it needs more time, you put it back in the oven. You put it back in the sun. There's the print. There is no developer. The sun brings out the image. And now we have to keep the image. The first thing that's done, it's taken into a dark room where there's a sink and put into water that has a little bit of salt. And the reason for that is to get rid of the excess silver that you don't need anymore. And you can see that is the white cloudy precipitate in the water. This is putting it into the fixer. Notice that on the left-hand side, you can still see the original printed out color, but as it hits that fixer, it makes it much, much lighter. The early salted paper prints were fixed, and that's it, not toned. And I'll talk about that in a second. It would then go into a uh, container of water. Uh, good washing and good fixing weren't really known very well in the early days. There were even committees to figure out in the 1850s why their prints were fading. And there's the dry print. Notice in this print, it does have a flaw. There was a little speck on the negative, which brings in retouching. If you think Photoshop is new, it's been around since the beginning of photography, which includes painting out skies, changing things. Listen, you know, anybody good with their hands could change a photograph just by painting either on the negative, or in this case, we're just filling in the open space with some watercolor. And here we have the original negative. And again, this is on a table, not on a, not on a light table, not lit from below, but it's on a table. And now you can see that little spot that printed out white originally. It has a beautiful kind of a golden color because of the beeswax, which was used to mostly um, counteract the, the texture of the paper that the negative was made on. It would make little squares, little dots, if you didn't use wax. And the prints. Now, this print is the one that I showed printing. This one had an extra step of toning with gold, which made the image a more cool color. Instead of this kind of chocolate brown, we have semi-sweet chocolate in the toned version. Uh, most people feel that that was for permanence. Mm, I think it's more for aesthetics myself. Uh, every albumin print ever made was gold toned, and most of them are faded. So I think that probably the gold toning um, is really more for the, I feel, more for the color. And I would draw your attention to the negative, which in itself is probably one of the most beautiful objects in photography ever made. Uh, Talbot himself felt that the negative was much more important than the final print. And, uh, when you look at an, an albumin print or a salted paper print and one of these negatives, you can see why he would be attractive, attracted to the, uh, the color and tonality of the negative. So, there'll be a test later on. <laughs> but this will get you started 
on at least knowing what a solid paper print is. Uh, after the um, after the roundtable discussion, I did bring some prints with me, including photogenic drawings, real ones, that you can handle. So you would never get that opportunity anywhere else but Yale. And uh, I also have, have some of my own work. Um, and there is one of mine. I like spirit photography. So this is one of my images. And uh, that's me, self-portraiture. So it's a four or five minute exposure on a wet collodion glass plate negative. And this is a gold tone salted paper print. Thank you. Aesthetic, the aesthetics, the particular aesthetics of the of, of the salt print, and I want to just carry on with uh, the, the the last uh, or this your whole sequence of images, Mark. I'm a troublemaker, so be then, careful. Then then ending with with, with that uh, with that wonderful photograph um, that, that was the last one you showed oh, that, mine. that you made, the one that you made. Um, to to ask um, what what you feel is the um, the particular qualities of of of, of using this the, the, this this very antique method of, of 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 creating photographs beyond just what it what it gives us in terms of understanding uh, the, 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 the historical process? It's, a, it's an interesting question because when I exhibit my work, the last thing I want to do is talk about how it's made. Mm -hmm. When you go to an exhibit and look at paintings, you don't ask the, the artist what brushes they use. Right. And so I, I, as a photo historian, I do like to talk about the evolution of the process. But as an artist wearing a different hat, I don't want to talk about it at all. Uh, what I do like about the aesthetic is the softness that it relates to the final print. Now, mind you, that image was made with a glass negative, which has very high resolution. And then using a paper process, which kind of takes away from that kind of detail. But there's a certain luminous quality about salted paper prints. And uh, one thing we haven't talked about is the fact that it's, that image is also waxed. So there were things that were added to these prints. And the waxing of a print uh, is the difference between maybe seeing a photograph in a tray of, of liquid and then seeing it dry. Every photographer loves the way it looks in the liquid in the darkroom. And the waxing kind of helps that. Mm -hmm. And I hope if, if I can turn to you and, and ask for, uh, for a, a kind of historical sense of uh, what was the, the aesthetic frame of reference uh, mm. of, of, for the salt print at the time that it was made, and, or at, at the time that it was developed as a process, and then as other um, possibilities came open to, to, to photographers so that the salt print wasn't the only game in town. Well, the salt print was introduced simultaneously with a process called the daguerreotype process, which produced an image on a highly polished silver plate. And as you can see in the images there on the screen, uh, a Talbot photograph of his daughter next to a daguerreotype uh, of a young girl in France. Um, the choice for photographers right from the beginning was a, a paper print, a salted paper print, or a daguerreotype. And right away, the differences between these approaches was uh, much debated. Initially, it was felt that the salted paper print um, lost in comparison to the daguerreotype, which produced um, much higher image resolution and appeared to give a much richer range of tones from light to dark. 
Um, but as time went on, the, um, the way in which the daguerreotype seemed to be the process of commerce, of uh, commercial photography, left the salted paper print um, in a particular a particularly sort of high status role as a, as a process that tended to be used by amateurs and artists. And this was allied to its material characteristics, which is that softness of definition. Um, indeed, you know, the peculiar quality of the salted paper print is that the image resides in the upper fibers of the paper the solutions soak into the paper, and so the image is formed um, within the paper rather than sitting on top of the paper as a coating, um, as the metal plate of the daguerreotype, or as a coating as we might imagine later photographic prints, the albumin print, but in more recent times, the gelatin silver print. Um, so the sense that the salted paper print is an object as much as an image is something that we now today can be very aware of and find quite magical, but it wasn't outside of the frame of reference in its own early time. And so when people start talking about the salted paper print as an artistic process, um, one of the things they're looking at is the way in which the kind of indistinctness, the vagueness is actually a marvelous visual opportunity, that it's not simply a literal depiction, that there's more going on there. There's room for the imagination, perhaps. There's room for the possibilities that um, accrue to other uh, works on paper, non-photographic works on paper. Um, and so when the salted paper print is talked about, it's often talked about in terms of other, um, other kinds of works on paper, uh, prints and drawings specifically. And when Hill and Adamson's work is first reviewed, their very first year, their very first exhibition in 1843, the reviewer says that if you look at these prints, you if you didn't realize that you were looking at a new technology, you could be forgiven for thinking <laughs> that you were looking at the finest uh, sepia drawings by, by a master. So well, the, that's an insert in the, the Pencil of Nature, isn't it? They, they well, pasted it's, in a, didn't they paste in a little insert saying, you know, you may be confused that these are, <laughs> yeah, are, are well, it was maybe a, drawings? It was a <laughs> review in an, in an Edinburgh yeah. uh, newspaper oh, okay. um, by Hugh Miller and mm. um, talking about Hill and Adamson's work, so, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to throw in, I think, maybe the next slide. Yeah. Um, <coughs> to, to make this connection with, with, with contemporary watercolor practice, um, and I have here a, a, a watercolor by Peter DeWint from the, the 1830s in the collection here um, with this, this sort of iconic uh, uh, photograph, uh, uh, salt print by, by Fox Talbot and, uh, and uh, Calvert Richard Jones. And um, to, to make the point that, that in the kind of standard watercolor technique of the of the uh, of, of the sort of ro the romantic period, uh, there the, the the watercolor is is uh, is translucent, <coughs> and 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 it, this kind of use of, of of watercolor is based on on the um, on on these translucent washes of color, which actually sink into the paper. So so the image becomes part of the paper in, in much the same way that you get in, in, in the salt print. Now, the, the thing is that, that, that watercolor aesthetics are, are kind of changing at the same time that, that photographic aesthetics are, are, are developing, so that you, you have works like, like these. Um, in which, uh, in which detail is much more important, uh, uh, color is more intense, um, 
and there's a greater reliance on, on uh, opaque uh, uh, watercolor, or what, what, the, what the British would refer to as body color. And, um, and, and, and so there, sort of as with the albumen print, the, the color sits on the paper in a layer on the paper rather than rather than sinking into it. And I just, just kind of I think it's just important to, to remember that they had choices. Yeah. In yeah. the beginning they didn't. You know, in the beginning yeah. there was photograph and then there was photograph on glass and photograph on metal and in, in the era that the salted paper print was being made, you had a choice of many different negatives. You could have uh, glass negatives, you could have paper negatives, uh, there were albumin negatives. Um, they all had their own aesthetics, so you could have a choice. A lot of people feel that once you have one process, it supersedes the last. Right. And right. the aesthetic of having the softness, not just of the paper, but the paper negative itself. There are people championing the, uh, the paper negative well into the 1870s, long after most people had given it up. Later, they Even take later. it up in the 1890s. Yeah, well, yeah. then they bring it back, and, and mm. the influence of, uh, of uh, Hill and Adamson's portraits on uh, Julie Margaret Cameron and others later mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. So there, there are people assuming that um, they could use a process to make a, a sharp picture, and they didn't have any other choice. And, and yet they had lots of choices. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's, I think it's, it's useful to just um, uh, pick apart the way that photographers, um, particularly in the 1850s, start to debate their approaches and the way that the materials that they're using um, affect their results and how that might align itself to, to art, to fine art, so that, um, in Britain, for example, typically the photographers are lagging behind um, contemporary art. The 1850s is a time when pre-Raphaelitism is a relatively new uh, phase of, of art in Britain and that uh, pre-Raphaelite um, attention to objective observation and, and precise delineation is actually read by photographers as being scientific and then they they break themselves up into camps with the scientific photographers calling themselves pre-Raphaelite. But the artistic photographers are actually citing Joshua Reynolds from the late 18th century. They're citing an, an older uh, time of art, an older phase which already has an imprimatur of status um, in the academy particularly. So they don't push themselves forward into this new and dicey kind of pre-Raphaelite phase. They're, they're giving themselves a kind of um, uh, uh, a borrowed status. Yeah. So uh, it, how does this play out, Chitra, in, in, in th this uh, debate over, over clarity and detail and, and, and a kind of artistic softness? How does that play out in terms of the scientific community, the scientific yeah, so point of view. It's, it's interesting that that invocation of, of science as a, or of scientificness as a quality that is allied with clarity and detail and things like that, because in the world of natural science in the kind of, you know, the decades after photography's public announcement, it's not at all obvious that detail and clarity are what you're after in every kind of science. It really depends on mm -hmm. whose science you're talking about. So certainly if you are, um, an astronomer interested in, in getting a, you know, a detailed record of, of the, the, um, you know, the shape of all the craters on the moon, then detail is what you're after. But if you are a chemist, say, and what you're interested in in a photograph is this sort of sensitive surface and the record of kind of chemical activity that's happening on that surface, then detail and kind of optical clarity are irrelevant. They're kind of a distraction from what it's, from what the real purpose of this object is. And so there's, there's a really interesting debate um, right in 1839 in those kind of first months after photography is kind of is announced to the public, a debate between two prominent French scientists over exactly this issue. Um, so the, the famous French astronomer and mathematician Francois Arago, who is the person who announces photography to the public in, in Paris, um, announces Daguerre's process for making photographs on metal plates. 
Um, he says that the purpose of photography is to basically insert this sensitive surface, insert the camera into places where human visual judgment is being used. So, you know, you know, instead of looking through a telescope's eyepiece, you take a photograph through the telescope's eyepiece. And the and once he hears about Talbot's process, he immediately says, "Oh, well, you know, the the, the you can't get nearly as much clarity in detail." In, in this paper photography. So, you know, this is the only real direction forward for science. But his rival, Jean-Baptiste Biot, who is a chemist and kind of um, expert in physical optics, Biot says, well, no, 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 that's, that's beside the point. Like, what I'm after is understanding the interaction between light and these salts and the material of the paper. Mm -hmm. And Talbot's process is so much better understood chemically. So, you know, it, then, then the daguerreotype is we don't really know what's happening on that surface. We just know mm -hmm. that we're getting a pretty picture. And so he really champions Talbot's paper process. And he says, this is the direction forward for science. And if I could have the um, clicker for a moment, there's a kind of a thread that you can follow from early photography going forward in natural science that follows that kind of B.O. style approach where it's about this kind of record of, of, of optical and chemical transcriptions. There's no camera involved at all. So it's not about what we see, it's about capturing non-visual events. And you can follow it all the way through to early x-rays, to experiments on radioactivity, where kind of detail and clarity aren't what it's about. It's about registering the presence of invisible forces and radiations. Mm -hmm. well, there's another thing about this. You know, we often think of a um, a photographic record as being some, somewhat truthful, and there never has been any truth in photography. Uh, if you take a picture of a lemon with a calotype negative, it comes out black in the print. Bright yellow photographs black, bright red. Blue photographs white. If you take a picture of a beautiful blue sky with white clouds, you get a blank sky with no clouds. Mm -hmm. And on top of it, the final print is monochromatic, which I guess people could be used to because, you know, prints, if you're used to looking at engravings or mm -hmm. lithographs, you, you can accept that. But there's optics. You know, optics can change things quite a bit. You can take one type of a lens, another, get a completely different photograph. So we're willing to take some kind of truth. We're willing to take the truth that we want and kind of push aside the rest of them mainly because of sensitivity to colors. Yeah. We should perhaps move on because um, time is, <laughs> is, is, is running short. And I, and I, I, I did want to um, explore the idea of the, or ideas about the, the, the social and institutional histories of, 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 of the salt print. And Chitra, I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about about um, the institutions that that shape the uh, the development of the salt prints that we see in the exhibition. Yeah, sure. Um, let me skip forward a little here. Um, so I, I mentioned earlier the British Museum. Um, in fact, the British Museum's program to photograph all of its artifacts systematically failed on a, a number of times over the, over the later decades. Um, but they were funding a lot of um, excavations and, and expeditions into the Near East, kind of finding new archaeological objects and then bringing them back and, fo and photographing them um, at the museum. In general, um, if you start to look at the, the photographic travelers and archaeologists who are going out and photographing in the field, you start to see how um, the, the trajectories they're following, the itineraries they're following, the sequence of monuments that they're, um, that they're kind of photographing in turn have been set in place by historical events that have occurred in some cases almost a generation before they've, they've gotten there, or more actually. Um, and so for the case of Felix Tenar in Egypt, um, he's taking, he's following a route up the Nile that was already set in place by Napoleon's failed expedition, his failed invasion of Egypt that began in 1798. Napoleon takes with him um, on that expedition that fails a whole kind of, um, a giant contingent of naturalists, artists, engineers, um, uh, people who are, tr who are systematically documenting the kind of places and culture and natural resources of this place that they're hoping to take over and have be theirs. And they install these institutions like the Egyptian Institute in Cairo, um, the Oriental Society back in Paris, that are supposed to then support future travel 
um, into those areas. And so even when they fail to um, take over Egypt, they're developing cultural power in the region, and part of the way that they're doing that is funding travelers like Tainar, like Ducombe, and others um, to go and photograph. And so even though there's a kind of, there's clearly a, a, a new way of kind of photographic seeing that's coming out of these images, particularly for Tainar. I mean, he's um, trained as a civil engineer, and you have this kind of austere structural um, take on these sites that wasn't appearing in, in the work by other kinds of pictorial artists. But there's still, it's still kind of what he's after and the places that are considered worth documenting, worth bringing back, um, have already been kind of installed in, in cultural prominence mm -hmm. through these kind of geopolitical events. Mm -hmm. uh, Hope, what, what about the, the commercial side of, 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 of the commercial economy of of the salt print? Mm, well, um, printmaking, non-photographic printmaking, very much forms the basis for what would become a commercial market for photographs. Indeed, many of the photographers in this exhibition had uh, prior careers as lithographers, for example, David Octavius Hill, Edouard Baldou, um, the, uh, a number of French photographers had actually um, had reasonable careers already and they turned to photography as a new opportunity. Photography was seen as a potentially profitable arena. Certainly the uh, portrait studios were making a certain amount of money. So, um, and, 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 and very early on there were um, ways in which photographers were already signaling that connection, for example, in 1851 at the Crystal Palace exhibition, the exhibitors of paper prints um, were already using the term print mm -hmm. for describing their positive photographs, which would flag both the material comparisons and also the capacity for paper photography to produce multiples, just like traditional printmaking. And that's a very important aspect of an economy. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and then, um, Chitra, I think you um, were going to make a comment about the um, ways in which uh, photographic printing was um, evolving. Oh, there we go. Yeah, yes. I mean, I was, I was simply going to mention that um, starting with Talbot, photographers aren't necessarily printing their own work, and so Talbot sets up um, he does print his own work initially, and then he eventually sets up a workshop in Reading um, where he's got a team of people kind of producing these prints, and he's working with Nicholas Henneman, his former, um, former valet, former assistant, to kind of have to, to run that place. And so he's setting it up and representing it in, in these photographs like a, like a factory, which is what it's supposed to be. Um, it fails as a commercial venture, um, but as a signal as kind of what kind of economy these works were supposed to be a part of, mm -hmm. um, it still stands. Yeah, and it, and it certainly sets up a, um, a trajectory. Um, if we um, look at the kinds of uh, printmaking networks that were already established, they're conduits for new photographic publishers and printers. Um, so that, for example, um, uh, Eugène Pio's work was printed by a firm that was set up by a woman, Adèle Hubert de Fontaine, who based her operation on her husband's already established non-photographic printing firm, a very successful firm. And, um, and then when you look at uh, Blancard Everard, whose firm produced, actually there are many prints in this exhibition that are Blancard Everard prints. He set up a printing company in Lille and um, over the course of about four years produced more than 100,000 um, photographic prints. And these were largely published in albums. The, you know, the, the, the display of these photographs in the exhibition is something of a, a anachronism, if you will, because most photographs in those early years were shown in, um, in albums. In fact, the um, very earliest French photographic society, the Société Héliographique, when they wanted to put an exhibition together to rival the Salon, um, they actually put together an album. 
So um, it's a, it's a, the, the world of display and presentation and selling is very much um, coalesces around these kinds of modes. It was very much about the package too, the, the, the album covers and the presentation of these things, mm -hmm. these massive books. They're massive and very heavy. I'm curious, who, who bought these things? Who were they selling them to? Well, they were. What was, what was the average person lugging that thing home? Mm. <laughs> well, some of them are kind of glorified coffee table books. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, they could uh, be the coffee table. And, <laughs> and yes, <laughs> and people could buy prints separately yeah. and have them sort of have them bound up themselves. Um, but uh, they they are for connoisseurs. Mm. They're for the the pictures of of views in distant lands are for um, armchair travelers. And there's, you know, there are wonderful things in the photographic journals saying, you know, there you are in your room in Paris and looking over rooftops, but if you just open the album, you're in forests mm -hmm. and, and coastlines and um, temples and monuments and, and distant lands. And they have a feeling of lithography, uh, notwithstanding the color. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a salted paper print either has kind of a, a, a warmish brown or a cooler brown look, and, and lithography is almost always black. It's black ink. So that uh, when Blanc Harevrar was making those developed out salt prints, which are black. Yes, which you can which see there. Which is what you have up yeah. here. Uh, it was something that I believe when people saw them, uh, even though he made a lot and he made a lot of the albums, I, I don't, the process wasn't very popular. And I think a lot of people felt that, no, no, that can't be a photograph. A photograph has this aesthetic and this color. Mm. And this new process is black and white, which of course is what we end up having later although, on in this century. Yeah, although in the 1850s there are a number of people who are kind of key people mm. who are saying actually, I much prefer the color mm -hmm. of a photograph that is more like that of a print. And Blancard Everard's British partner actually says, you know, a friend of mine was looking at these prints the other day and, and said, oh, but they're so beautiful. I'd never imagine them to be photographs. Kind of they look it, like right? etchings. Right, it, so, it kind of yeah. elevates it. It does elevate to, them. Back to the formal print aesthetic. Yeah, But, but the texture of them is very much yeah. alike. When you look at a, a lithograph and you, when you look at a <coughs> salted paper print, uh, this kind of speckly, mealy kind of texture that you get. On a nice similar. paper with a nice tooth to yeah. it, yeah. Uh -oh. mm. I mean, I think a lot of this, this language of aesthetic preference mm. around those particular qualities of salt prints, um, particularly in the, the years after albumin prints take off as a kind of commercial paper, um, and these things start to be more widespread and more easily purchasable by um, people of kind of middling classes and even working class, um, some of this language of aesthetic preference is also coding social anxieties yeah. about who mm. should be allowed <laughs> to kind of partake in this economy of images, mm. who, you know, there are these kind of like, you know, dirty jobbing photographers who are, you know, are making portraits in these tiny formats cranking and them out, cranking right? them out, exactly, whereas the real artists might turn to these practices that give them, um, give them that more control, give them that, that, fe that feeling of softness and, and, well, and is, tactility. Well, if an average and, person bought a photograph, it was a, a carte de visite or, or a exactly. stereo card. They weren't buying large prints. Mm -hmm. Whereas someone who's a connoisseur and really enjoys the aesthetic of the print aesthetic, they would gravitate to the softer look, either with a softer negative or softer printing process, as opposed to albumin printing from a glass negative, which is so sharp and so shiny. Mm -hmm and is seen as rather vulgar yeah, by comparison no, sure. with salted paper prints. There's a lot of that. I teach mm. people yes, how to make Yes, we hear all this kind prints. of like class language yeah, used yeah. to distinguish and the better forms from that. operating the, at that yeah. time in the, in the middle of the 19th century. I Absolutely. can make a beautiful albumin print. I'll never use it for my work. Mm. There you go. Mm. I'm telling yeah. you. <laughs> Just because you know it doesn't mean you should use it. Right? Mm. Well, we've, we've run considerably over time, so I think we will, we will bring this to a close um, so you can all go upstairs and uh, um, look at the exhibition, um, enjoy, uh, enjoy a, a, a drink at the reception, and, and ask uh, any <coughs> questions you have of, uh, of our distinguished panel up there in the reception. Thank you very much. Thank you.